I heard them as soon as I entered my sister-in-law's kitchen through the back door. I could tell they had a fantastic time by the way they laughed so loudly. My wife had gone to Tony's bridal shower with a dozen other women, along with our daughter Maria, her older sister Anita, and our niece. They were the only four in the living room, but I could tell they'd had a lot of wine that afternoon by the way they cackled and spoke loudly. Even though they weren't intoxicated, they were all in a pretty pleasant mood. I was certain they hadn't even heard me enter because they were so boisterous and preoccupied with their hen celebration. I would chuckle to myself as I considered these four. Their dark hair and skin were inherited from their Hispanic ancestry. I was chuckling because the younger ones were almost boyishly slim. Like many Hispanic women, but their mothers had... Mm, bloomed. At this point, Betty and Anita would be regarded as full-figured. Not that I'm gonna hurl stones because I still think Betty's pretty, but I also have my own gut. My hairline is receding faster than a politician's election. Night campaign pledge. And I'm a good 30 pounds overweight. We were empty nesters when we got married in college, along with his spouse and our lone grandson. Our son Juan was stationed in Germany while serving in the Air Force. Richard, Maria's husband, and her were still young. We're simply regular people aiming to reach retirement. We're just your average suburban couple. We both have jobs, solid incomes, and in a few years, we'll be homeowners. Even if my wife's laughter was helped by alcohol, it was still nice to hear. Our 22-year marriage has been difficult for the past few years. It may not have been the kind of marriage that others would have preferred, but for us, it had been a good marriage for the most part. With the exception of our sexual lives, I suppose I'm mostly to blame for my current circumstances because every partnership has one member who is more aggressive or dominant than the other. When those elements are present in a marriage, the pair operates more like a team under the direction of a team leader than under a dictatorship. Though it may appear that I lack a backbone, you would be mistaken to believe such. Normally, I am quite silent and a little passive. I also steer clear of confrontations. It's a childhood matter that only I have to worry about. While I don't always comply with my wife's requests, I do so the majority of the time. I primarily do it to maintain harmony, but I also do it because I don't really care how things turn out. Where do we eat? Which kind of home do we occupy? Which vehicle do we drive? Not choices that would change my life. Because of our respective tendencies, Betty usually finds up in charge of our home. To be honest, we are happy in our marriage aside from the sexual issue. Betty's usually simply a very headstrong girl, not some controlling shrew. But when it came to our sexual life, she dug in. Although my wife had always had a low sex desire, within the past three years, it had completely stopped. Despite her refusal to seek medical attention, she said it was due to menopause. We hadn't made love for a number of years prior to having sex till two years ago. Since it's difficult to make love when only one partner is actively involved, it had just been sex. Now, I don't mean to give the impression that sex was necessary for our marriage, but it was certainly significant to me. Our relationship suffered greatly without it, particularly in the intimate parts. Thinking back to the serious talks that had begun three years prior, I shuddered. Well, they began as talks and quickly descended into nasty altercations. The intensity with which my wife addressed my need and desire for sex startled me. She was very clear that we needed to consider getting a divorce if all I wanted was sex. I told her that all I wanted was to make love to my wife and that I didn't want sex at all. She replied it would be a cold day in hell before she was my own private little sex toy. She told me that until both of them wanted to, it wouldn't be making love. About a year after these battles, the Cold War began. I'm not sure when it even started. The silence was startling after months of screaming and yelling, though it could have been years before. Any hug or touch was soon construed as a sexual approach, which I politely and quickly declined. Then I made a choice that impacted my life in the years that followed. I did not consider divorce because I still loved my wife. 
It meant trying to make ends meet in an unsatisfying marriage. My logic was simple. Good or bad, I vowed to do something about it. Things were better in our marriage in most aspects. Things were just as bad in terms of our romantic life. And while things weren't as rosy as I expected, I knew I could handle it. I was willing to make sacrifices for my spouse and our marriage. I knew that for a marriage to be successful, both partners had to be willing to make concessions. I believed that our mutual love and respect was enough to overcome the problems that arise from time to time in any marital relationship. That's what I thought, however, as I started to surprise the quartet by storming out of the kitchen. My lovely wife's response made it clear that she didn't agree with my niece's remarks, which stopped me cold. Not even near. Oh my God, Aunt Betty, Tony exclaimed. You've never had an orgasm? Heavens no, I've had plenty of them. My spouse laughed. Just not with your Uncle Terry. One of them gave a little squeak and the rest burst out laughing. Actually, that's not true, Betty said. Your uncle has given me a handful of small ones over the past 20 years, but usually I've had to fake it most of our marriage. I heard my daughter say, Mama, I can't believe you cheated on Daddy, Betty retorted. Cheated? Oh no, honey, I've never cheated. But you said, All those huge ecstasy were back in college with some of the guys I dated before I married your father. Actually, it was only two of my ex-boyfriends. They were very well hung and, well, let's say they made your father look rather small. Both of those guys would make me lose consciousness. There were snickers and snorts across the room. Anita squealed like the little sister she was. I know one of them. Betty growled, hush, and returned to their merriment. Maria remarked, lowering her voice and trying not to laugh. Okay, Mom, who was it? Leon piped up Anita. It had to be Leon. Oh my God, yes, Leon, my wife exclaimed, panting. Damn, that guy knows how to have sex. My daughter gasped and laughed. Mom, tongue. There's no other way to put it, honey. That guy knew how to pleasure women. After a night with him, I had to be pulled off the ceiling. Aunt Betty, it's awful, Tony moaned sorrowfully. Oh no, dear. Every woman needs to have at least one great lover in their lives. I've been fortunate to have had two, Leon and Douglas. Oh my God, sis, it's not Douglas Kemp, exclaimed Betty's sister. I heard my wife nod, and I heard Betty's sister chuckle, too. My daughter said, Who's Douglas Kemp? Anita said, Douglas was our ideal next-door neighbor. But Betty, he was as old as Papa. Betty tittered, yeah. And he was very experienced, if you know what I mean. Tony calmly said, That's not what I meant, Aunt Betty, attempting to refocus the topic. What I meant was, it's horrible you've been trapped in a marriage with bad sex. I'm not sure I could do that. Well, honey, ecstasy aren't everything. And aside from that, having sex with your Uncle Terry isn't all that fulfilling. Yeah, I usually have to fake it, but it's cute how hard he tries. As if speaking to a newborn, my wife gushed. Actually, I'm amazed at how hard he tries. Nothing compares to witnessing a man offer you everything he has. It gives me a huge lift to my ego. The women laughed all around me as I resisted the temptation to puke. So why do you always cut him off? After she had regained self-control, my daughter asked, Maria. Betty gave a hiss. I've heard the argument since I was a teenager. Come on, Mom, Mom. I'm aware that was the only apparent disagreement you and Daddy ever had. Why is Dad a celibate while he's not that horrible in bed? Honey, I'm not celibate, my wife yelled back. It's just more convenient and fulfilling to use Leon the Lion occasionally. There was a momentary, awkward silence before Betty spoke again. Once more, the women all broke out into giggles. Sweetheart, my spouse said. I love your father, but in a marriage you have to make sure you're the one in control. You already know that. I've seen you doing it with Richard and you two haven't even been married a year. 
It'll take some time, but it'll be worth it. You'll get him trained. The idea of my baby child carrying on her mother's legacy shattered my heart. As for your father and I, well, your father is your typical middle-aged man, complete with an overhanging gut and a receding hairline. Let's face it, Maria. Your father isn't as hot as he was when we first got married. Mom, you're not so young yourself, Maria reprimanded. True, but I still have these... I heard them all laugh and utter noises that indicated agreement. My wife mentioned something, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Tony then muttered something that I couldn't quite make out. My devoted wife answered, Why would I leave him? He's a wonderful provider and father, and now that I've finally taught him completely, you know what? The best advice I can give any woman getting married is to train your husband as soon as possible. Use whatever tool is necessary. Screaming, pouting, crying, or even having sex if necessary. But establish authority as soon as possible. Aunt Betty, that seems pretty cold, Tony murmured. Anita chimed in. I wish I had done it earlier with your father. Maybe he wouldn't have run off. Um, um, Tony growled. Yes, it is accurate. Had I given him a shorter leash, he would not have believed that he could cuddle up on me. Betty scoffed and said, Oh my goodness, sis. Fixing that man would have been the only way to keep that man devoted. Every woman let out a howl. I'm not sure even that would have worked, Anita scoffed. Well, it worked on Terry, my spouse boasted. I had him fixed right after Maria was born. Um, um. Maria hissed now. Don't mother me, please. My wife continued to impart her matronly wisdom on the group. Facts are, you always have to keep your man on a leash. And with a muzzle, if you can manage it. Yeah, Anita said. Just glance at Teresa across the street. She is the mother of three children by two separate men. Maria corrected me, saying there were three distinct fathers. There was a collective huff from the women. With disdain, my daughter said. And now, she's looking for a sugar daddy to help pay the bills. Anita chimed in. The trouble is, she'll probably find one. After all... She's only 30, and she still looks like she's 20. Some of the girls down at the beauty shop said she started charging for sex, Maria stated with sadness. Damn, I hope not, Anita replied. That'll mean the destruction of some marriages in the neighborhood in the near future, since most men can't keep it in their pants, my devoted spouse said. Let's face it, men are tough enough to house train, let alone take out in public unrestrained. The women started laughing, and then one of them gave a snort which made the others laugh uncontrollably. I'd had enough and left the kitchen. My daughter and sister-in-law were the next to notice me coming up from behind my wife. My niece was probably the first to notice me because of the expression on my face that made her stop smiling. My wife turned to check why the other three had stopped laughing, gave me a quick glance, brushed me off, and turned back around. Hey, hello, sweetie. We were merely discussing you, she chuckled. So I heard, I said in a chilly tone. Oh, honey, she responded in a patronizing manner. It was just girl talk. If you say so, I answered as I moved to stand in front of Tony and Maria. I bent down in front of Tony and looked directly into her face, observing her dread and worry. Uncle Terry? With a faltering voice, Tony said, I said, hush, baby. I know you've had a lot of advice today. If you don't mind, I'd want to contribute a bit of my own. She gave me a small nod and silently met my eyes again. I said bluntly, I want you to look at my face. My wife snickered. Terry, please, why all the drama? Ignoring her, I carried on conversing with the young soon. To be bride. Tony, this is really important. Please look at me and picture this as your Thomas's face. I said. Please, Maria, try to picture Richard's face like this. Girls, you got it? Both of them nodded, and I gazed at them with a ferocity that shocked me. Tears flooded my eyes, and I gave up trying to hide how hurt and angry I really was. I saw both of the young women start to cry. Now imagine the face of the man you say you adore. 
When he finds out that the woman he loves, and for whom he has abandoned all other women, is nothing more than a self-centered, lying damsel, you will see that very face. I heard gasps from behind me. Women, you have to realize that this is the look your husband will have when he realizes he has wasted years of his life on a woman who doesn't value him. If you deceive him and make him think he's the love of your life while secretly laughing at him, this is what you should anticipate seeing. Terry, give up. My spouse reprimanded me saying you're acting foolishly. I cried, I'm sorry, honey. Maybe you didn't train me well enough? Little known fact. If you beat a dog hard enough, he will eventually either jump on you or run away. I scoffed. Guess what? I'm not running. Any last signs of her alcohol buzz swiftly dissipated, and I saw the color drain from her face. I was confident that she now understood how bad things had gotten. I had never spoken to her in that way before, and I had never used those terms to refer to her in public. Terry, that's enough, my sister-in-law said. I won't have you talking like that to my sister. Anita, I snarled. I'd be very careful what you say. She sneered. This is my house, Terry. I won't be told what to do in my own home. I glared at my wife and replied, you're absolutely right. No one should dictate to you how to act in your own home. I guess my only option then is to leave, sort of like Carlos. I noticed that my remark had an impact. Anita was stunned and mute at my unexpected aggression. It always surprised me you'd wasted all that time and effort planning, scheming, to trap a feral piece of shit like Carlos. Everyone knew he had the morals of an alley cat. Why you thought getting pregnant and forcing him to marry you would change him is beyond me. Mama, exclaimed Tony. But, Anita, you're right, I went on. This is your home. If I don't like being here, I need to leave. Just like my marriage. I heard my daughter cry. Daddy, no. My dear, I whispered. I wonder how Richard will look at you after he finds out how well his mother-in-law trained her daughter. She begged Daddy, don't. Please don't say anything to him. I didn't even realize I was doing it to him. Maybe not, Maria. But he deserves to know. That's great, Terry, said my spouse threatening to ruin your daughter's marriage just because you got your feelings hurt. You're right, Betty. I am hurt, but that's not why I'll inform Richard about this little discussion. I'll tell him because any husband should be made aware if his wife is trying to train him like some friggin' pet. I saw the look of horror on every woman's face. I had never conversed with any of them in this way. They didn't know how to handle it because this was so out of character for me. To be honest, I had no idea how to stop the immense wrath that was exploding inside of me. I'm sorry, Betty, I murmured, trying to get myself together. My wife remarked in a patronizing, motherly manner. Well, I guess it was somewhat understandable. I suppose it would have been a bit of a shock to overhear some of the things you did, even if it was just girl talk. No, I replied sternly, not about that. If I would have known you were a size queen, I would have never wasted over 20 years of my love on you, trying to satisfy you. I pivoted to gaze upon my niece. Sure, it might hurt his ego at first, but I don't know any husbands who love their wives that won't try to learn to please them in the bedroom. Most men would welcome the practice. Tell him your needs and what you want from your sex with Thomas if it's not as satisfying as you'd like it to be. Every husband, Tony is aware that they will not always be able to please their wife, but they must have faith that they can most of the time. They must think their wife is happy in the bedroom and yet yearns for their husband's attention. It should if it sounds like what the majority of women require from their husbands. It is the desire of both men and women to be desired by their spouses, usually just them. The thing that keeps the man trying to be considerate and leave the toilet seat down or to cuddle after sex and not just roll over and fall asleep is called respect, and it is a form of love. It's the belief that their wife is satisfied with them that lets men do some of the things women typically enjoy. 
It allows them to sit through some chick flick and hand you a tissue or go shopping at the mall for hours and only buy one pair of shoes. Well, I'm sorry you mistook my love and kindness for weakness, I murmured, turning to face my wife. I promise that won't occur again. Terry, I really do love you, Betty murmured softly. Oh, what a bunch of nonsense. You don't treat someone you love like that, I chuckled. They don't have to go through obstacles in order to get your approval. Besides, I scoffed. I'll never believe anything you say to me again because I now know that your primary goal is to be in control at all costs. You love your small ideal existence more than you love me. The control and way of life are what you truly adore. Unfortunately, I fear that will soon change. Are you planning to file for divorce? Her eyes blazed now as she said, This is a no-fault state, Betty. We would likely split the money fairly equally in a divorce because we don't have children and have salaries that are similar to each other. Since neither of us can afford to buy the other out, we'll probably have to sell the house and divide the earnings. But I do have to wonder, what will I do with my half of the spending money when it's not going to ward things my wife thinks are important? I'll make sure it goes only toward things I want, of course. Naturally, things like those frequent out-of-town shopping sprees or your little weekend trips to the spa are gone, as is that project of installing a swimming pool in the backyard for the next summer since I don't swim. I won't be spending any more money on your clothes, shoes, or accessories. Since I'd have to ask myself the obvious question, all the makeup and beauty supplies are also gone. Since it's not me, who are you working so hard to make yourself seem lovely for? With all these financial cuts, I bet I have enough to pay Teresa's rent. Hell, I wonder what she's willing to do for it. If she's as bad a girl as you ladies say she is, I don't think she'd mind a little fondling from some old bald guy with a pot belly. Hell, with that kind of money, I could be her sugar daddy. Betty snapped, her face turning pale. What the hell are you talking about? You will no longer be in charge of our joint finances, and I will be choosing what to do with my money aside from paying bills. I can assure you that it won't be going to things that only you enjoy. What I'm talking about is no longer funding your little lifestyle. I'm talking about looking out for myself and my needs, since nobody else will. You know, perhaps I can find someone else even if Teresa rejects me. She most likely wouldn't refuse Richard or Thomas, though. When they realize they're being taught like animals in a circus for their spouse's enjoyment, I wonder what paths they'll take. Terry, that's not how it works. For the first time that day, my wife expressed genuine concern on her face as she spoke. As if it weren't. I gave her a sneer. I was certain that we would never return to our previous state and was starting to question whether users would even exist in the foreseeable future. Any love I once felt for her had become seriously contaminated. I must now leave this place. I have a lot of planning to do. Are you heading out? Aren't you even going to give me a ride home? A startled Betty said. Why? In an attempt to hide my hurt, I snorted and left the room, leaving the four horrified women behind. Following the bridal shower, Betty tried a number of strategies to patch things up with me that first week. First, she tried to brush everything off as wine talk. Then, it was back to it was just girl talk. When those didn't work, she became irate and tried a more direct approach. I'm not sure if this was a good thing or a bad thing. She scolded me one night, saying, For God's sake, Terry, so you got your feelings hurt? It's time to pull up your big boy pants and get over it. I had gone back to my guarded self up until that point. My outburst at the bridal shower had unsettled me. I hadn't been mean to Betty, but her comments set me off again. It's over with you. No. Wait. That would imply I'd even touch you. I growled at her. Who knew that this mouse could roar twice? Her jaw was hanging open as I stormed out of the room. I'm pretty confident using a blowtorch to my mechanical opponent made a statement. The next day, when she saw the melted remnants of Leon the lion on the kitchen table, I think she got the word that her controlling and dictating attitude wasn't appreciated. Eventually, I moved into the guest bedroom permanently, and since I hadn't been in our bed for a few years, 
I didn't really notice the difference. I also joined a gym and lost 10 pounds, which didn't show up all that much, but it made me feel better about myself. Along with that, I followed through on my threat to divide up the finances similarly to what we could probably expect in the event of a divorce. I found that I had a lot more cash flow when it wasn't all going toward things Betty wanted, so I used that first month's income to fulfill another threat, even though she was young enough to be my daughter. She sure didn't treat me like her father, and after spending a couple of hours with her, I was so drunk that night that I floated home. Betty was furious. You lying, scumbag son of a bitch. If you think I'll just kick back and let you sleep on me, she cried. You'll do what? You're gonna cut me off? I shouted back at her. It's far too late for that. What more could you do then? Withhold your passion and love. Oh no. It's too late for that too. Oh. Oh. I'll get a divorce from you. Are you serious? Assurance? Okay, go ahead and do it. I have my divorce papers signed and notarized. If you don't already have them, it didn't affect me the way it would have only a few months ago. And although I was disturbed, I wasn't surprised. What worried me most was the analogy I'd used at the bridal shower. An abused dog that runs away tends to be scared of everything. Even after he gets away from his abuser, a dog that fights back and turn mean and start attacking people, even those who are trying to help. Despite the anger building inside of me, I needed to try and maintain my composure. I'm sure people knew things weren't the same between Betty and me, but most weren't aware of the changes yet. Tony had her special day, and I got an embrace and a whispered thank you when we went through the reception line. Yes, we did attend Tony's wedding later that month, and we weren't too much of a distraction. I guess I was abusing her sister since Anita shunned me during the wedding and reception. It's not a huge loss because I haven't been asked back to her house since. There was some positive that came out of that bridal shower after all. Two young marriages got stronger. Maria and Richard had a rough go there for about a month. Did I tell him? No. I'm proud to say Maria had a tearful heart to heart with her husband. The resulting arguments and discussions will serve their marriage well, as it goes on. Betty took a different approach after the wedding, which I think was just as embarrassing as hers. Being apologetic? Terry, would you please allow us to speak? Depends on if you're going to try and berate me, or attack whatever self-esteem I have left. No, she said, clearly attempting to suppress her feelings. I just wanted to talk. Things have gotten really out of control, and if we can't work things out, I fear it may ruin our marriage. No, Betty, that marriage is dead, I remarked softly. The twenty years of marriage in which I have done everything in the world to make you happy and you have taken advantage of me is over. You wounded me. My darling, you stole the most priceless gift I could have given you, and you betrayed me. You took use of it to degrade and control me. I'd like to blame you for all of it, but I can't. I'm just as much to blame, since I allowed you to do that. If I'd stood up and fought you on things early in our marriage, maybe we could have had the type of marriage we both would have been happy with. However, given your views that it's a completion between us and their can, is only one winner. I doubt we ever had a chance. Hopefully, Maria and Richard will find a way to work through everything and have a good marriage. As she watched me intently, she asked, so what about us? What kind of marriage can we have then? I sat in silence. I had considered this endlessly. Is there any possibility I might return to the state of the marriage before learning of all those details? No. In a divorce, would I toss away 20 years of effort, blood, and tears? I was ignorant. For her part, is there anything Betty could say or do to start earning back my trust? In actuality, nothing. Then, without trust at its core, what kind of marriage could we possible have? I had absolutely no idea. Like I mentioned, ad nauseum. I guess our marriage will be more like roommates, where we're both responsible for our own needs and happiness. It's not the marriage I dreamed of, 
but it'll suffice for the immediate future. I'm not really sure what it looks like years from now. I suppose it'll depend on how you and I deal with the changes. Terry, I'm sorry I said those things. Her voice was emotional and raspy. Even after 20 years of marriage, there were still some things that were obvious. So I knew she hurt, but I was unable to pinpoint the precise cause of her suffering. Was it because of how deeply she damaged me? Though it might have just been my want to see it, I believed I saw genuine regret in her eyes. It could also have been her knowledge that she was losing control over me. I had my doubts. The unpleasant outcome of trust being betrayed is that the individual who was duped may never truly be certain that things are as they seem. She added, I'm sorry I hurt you like that, her eyes welling with tears. You need to realize I really do love you. No, Betty, you need to realize I really don't believe you. Maybe you are sorry. So am I, but it really doesn't change anything, does it? Our chat ended not so much with a bang as with a whimper because she didn't have an answer or at least not one that either of us thought I'd accept. I didn't know if she was genuinely sorry for how things had worked out or if it was just that things were going to change. In my selfishness, I wanted her to be in as much pain as I was. So I hoped there was love in her for me. She would naturally keep it hidden because, in her opinion, expressing that kind of feeling was a sign of weakness. I had thought this terrible thing would serve as a reminder to her that she needed and loved me. I was afraid our last conversation was just another ruse to win me back without really changing anything. In all honesty, I knew she most likely experienced both of those emotions. I prayed that this time, her love for me would outweigh her desire for self-preservation and control. It took me approximately a week to respond. Betty caught me off guard one evening. In the middle of the night, she entered my bedroom and got into my bed, nude. I leaped from my bed as if I had a scorpion nestled next to me. I said, what the hell are you doing? What the hell do you think? Hmm. She retorted angrily, clearly offended by my answer. That's the whole point, isn't it? As long as Terry gets me, he won't sulk, right? Survival on its own had prevailed. My sadness, anguish, and frustration all came pouring out. How the hell could I ever love someone like you? I sighed. Apparently, I didn't make myself clear enough at the bachelorette party. Betty, you win. I will never, ever touch your body again. Maybe I will. If you're going to go out and look for someone, she said. Then so can I. To her great dismay, I started giggling. That added to its humor. She frowned and snapped. What? What's so damn hilarious? I apologized. It was the thought of you going out and getting someone else. Out of habit. What? What? You don't think I could? No, I know you could. But Betty, do you really think you can get a guy without putting out? I'm almost positive most guys aren't looking for a fat, frigid, manipulative to spend the rest of their lives with. She let out a scream and fled the room in tears. That was pretty much the end of our discussion. It would be a vast understatement to say that the house has been chilly ever since. I had a few conversations with Juan to make sure he understood the circumstances. He kept out of it, even though I know he wasn't thrilled with it. No child likes to watch their parents' marriage fail. Nice one, boy. Maria attempted to speak up for her mother once. Just once. She departed in tears, not liking my reaction. I believe she understood that she needed to put her own needs ahead of our marriage. Additionally, I believe that she was taken aback when Teresa approached her in the beauty salon and gave her a slap in front of several other women. Teresa told my daughter and every other woman present that she was not a sex worker. There was also a matching handprint on my cheek. Teresa may have rejected me, but there was another woman in the neighborhood who didn't. Rose, a single mother in her late thirties, lived a few blocks away from Teresa. She was pretty, albeit not as hot as Teresa. She has a large posterior and is not very well endowed. 
but her face and brown eyes are really attractive. In addition, she has two teenage boys who, if they live to be 20 years old, will undoubtedly become state guests and delinquents. Years ago, their father abandoned them. Rose couldn't spend the time necessary to be the kind of mother she needed to be for them because she was killing herself working two jobs. She also never dated because of her family and her constant job schedule. We appeared to be benefiting from our arrangement for the foreseeable future. To be honest, I think it would be quite easy for our relationship to deteriorate into one of friendship with advantages. When it comes to her boundaries and expectations, she is quite clear. There's also very little shame on her part because she's never really liked my wife or her sister. We've been covertly dating for more than a month and it's good for both of us so far. Who knows, maybe later on I'll file for divorce if it turns into something more? So, is this the marriage and life I've always imagined? No, but Betty dashed those aspirations, and I let her, regrettably. I consider myself a survivor, but some may call me a sissy for letting her get away with it, and others will brand me in jerk for approaching Rose. I'm attempting to turn adversity into opportunity. Part 2 I suppose there is something to the adage that opposites attract. Although Shelley and I differ greatly in many aspects, I believe that we were in total accord on the most crucial ones. I think that's where I went wrong. I pondered. Sitting in the living room of my in-laws, I looked at the four of them in silence. Peggy and Brian Johnson, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, examined me silently. Maggie, my wife's elder sister, sat and scowled while my three-year-old wife sat there silently begging me with her dark green eyes. They always seemed to shine, even when they were crying, as if she held a secret that was just waiting to be revealed. We convened for a straightforward reason. Two days prior, I had served my wife with divorce papers. Most individuals are inclined to pay attention to that. Why, therefore, was her sister present? Well, mostly because she had a major role in my marriage's breakdown. I had hoped that we could get everything out on the table and spare ourselves the never-ending, he said. And she said that characterizes most divorces. That was my intention, but I also knew that the four people seated across from me had other plans. I began, thank you for coming to see me, Brian remarked. This is quite a surprise for all of us. Shelley has told us what happened, and I can tell you we're both very disappointed in both our daughters. What they did was stupid and childish, but to divorce her because of it seems extreme. I understand how you might feel that way, so that's why I'm here tonight. I wanted to get everything in the open so there weren't any misunderstandings. Shelley and I have only been married a few years and we rent, so there shouldn't be much to divide other than our small bank account. A simple, even split should take care of it, Brian asked quietly. Don't you feel like you're rushing a bit, son? What they did was bad, but a divorce? Yes, it was bad, I said with a sigh. But I doubt they told you everything. I'm also sure Shelley isn't seeing everything that's happened as well. Mr. Johnson, what were you told about that night? Okay, he murmured, getting his bearings. As you and Shelley have been fighting over Shelley's relationship with her sister for the past few months... We all know that Maggie is still very hurt and angry from her divorce. You noticed, as we all have, that Maggie is still very hurt and angry. So you felt that it was hurting Shelley and that's why you were acting in that way. I know you felt that way since you've talked to Peggy and me about it several times. But you started telling Shelley a month ago that she had to completely cease talking to and seeing Maggie. You insisted that she stop communicating with her sister. It really devastated them both because they are so close. Shelley declined and carried on conversing and dating Maggie. I nodded. So far, it was true. More than a month prior, I had employed a private investigator to spend a night with Shelley and Maggie. While the following report wasn't as dire as I had feared, it was nevertheless unsatisfactory and it was clear that changes had to be made before things escalated beyond control. Then last Saturday night, while she was out with Maggie, you and Shelley got into a fight, he went on. 
After a few hurtful remarks made out of rage, my two daughters pretended to be kids and attempted to justify their positions. Shelly said they'd been drinking and came up with the idea to make you realize Shelly was still very attractive to other men. Then, Shelly would tell you that she still chose you, but she'd make her own decisions. It was an incredibly juvenile idea. I certainly won't disagree, but you don't have the entire picture. May I? The parents gave each other a nod. First, I hope everyone knows how much I love Shelly. Shelly nodded this time joining her parents. But Maggie snorted and rolled her eyes. It was not a surprise. For my sister-in-law, the previous few years had not been easy. After four years of marriage, she and her daughter Jamie, then two years old, had been abandoned by Derek in favor of a tiny 18-year-old who worked in his office. That was barely a year into Shelley and my marriage. Maggie took it hard and from then on, she thought all men were jerks who were just in it for the sex. There are a lot of males who fit that description, so I couldn't really blame her for feeling that way. The issue was that my wife and our marriage were being negatively impacted by her pain and rage. More than just sisters, Maggie and Shelley were lifelong friends. Maggie was my wife's idol. She was a few years older than Shelley. In the year and a half following her divorce, Shelly had found herself comforting Maggie more and more. A few months back, they started going out for a girls' night out every Saturday, which wasn't a problem at first. At first, everything between Shelly and me was fine. But eventually, things got tense. It had been the worst month ever. I had been having regular arguments with Shelly. Then, last Saturday, after Shelly and Maggie attempted to correct me, everything broke out. As a result, on Monday, I filed for divorce, and on Thursday afternoon, I had her served. That ultimately resulted in this gathering at my in-laws' home. Although they are just as dysfunctional as any other family, my in-laws are rather good. Despite being the leader of the household, Brian truly has a soft place for his daughters. Despite her tendency toward quietness, Peggy is the family's enforcer of rules. Thankfully or sadly, they avoid becoming involved in their daughter's marital issues. That might be helpful most of the time, but it didn't improve Maggie's or our marriage. Regardless of whether you believe me or not, I really do love Shelley. When I first met her, it was like my world exploded. I'd never met someone so beautiful and full of life. I turned to look at my spouse. When I said that Shelley truly rocked my world, I wasn't kidding. She resembles her mother and sister in that she is a lovely, tiny brunette. Though not breathtakingly beautiful, they were certainly attractive enough to draw the interest of most men in any place they entered. In high school and college, Shelley was that pretty, popular girl who knew everyone and was friends with most of them. Although she wasn't the most attractive or prom queen at school, she was consistently ranked in the top ten. At every gathering, she was invariably the life of the party and the unofficial hostess. Remarkably, she is a younger clone of Maggie's sibling from before their divorce. Most of my former girlfriends think I'm cute and even attractive. I also have a fair amount of pragmatism. While some would describe it as anal retentive, Others would say it's incredibly mature for my age. I've heard my ex-girlfriends refer to me as idiots. Whatever the moniker, I had a steady, well-organized life before Shelley. Boring. Shelley and I had been friends since our undergraduate days, and I had just graduated. We postponed getting married until after she graduated as well. I know, began I, I said, when you married me that you brought color into my life. Of course... I was trying to be romantic, but it was also the truth. You really were my world. Todd, don't say it that way. We've got issues, but we can work through this, honey, my spouse begged. I'm so sorry I did that to you, but we can get through this. I still love you. To be honest, Shelley, I'm not so sure. For a marriage to work, both parties have to want to stay in it. I'm not sure that's the case anymore. It is. I promise you, it still is. Maggie moaned. Oh, please, could you just jerk her around a little bit more?
Peggy pleaded Maggie. Please. Maggie snorted. Come on, Mama. We all know he's always telling her what to do. God, she's more like a servant than a wife, I said quietly. Is that how you still feel, Shelley? Shelley had the appearance of a deer struck by headlights. Before we were married, this had been one of our biggest worries. We discussed it then, and we talked about it a lot since. I felt that we complimented one another. My weaknesses complemented her strengths, and her strengths compensated for my limitations. She informed me that was also what she thought. It seemed that something had shifted. Well, occasionally my spouse mumbled while wiping a tear from her eye. I know we've talked about it before many times, I replied softly. At least back when we were still talking and not yelling at each other. Maggie scoffed and said, Well, it looks like you didn't listen, did you? Maggie, I know everyone has been trying to give you time to recover since your divorce, but will you shut the hell up? My sister-in-law recoiled as if she had just received a slap. Her father said something just as she was about to give me a hard time. Maggie, please, he added quietly. Let's not let this get into a yelling match. No one wins that way. Daddy, I'm not going to let this bastard tell me to. Peggy yelled, Maggie, shut up. The hush that followed was unsettling. Maggie took a seat back and started crying. How long had it been since her parents had spoken to her that way, I pondered. It had been far too long in my perspective. Maggie, I began coolly, attempting to defuse the situation. I'm sorry you fell in love and married that piece of shit excuse for a guy. What he did was terrible. Completely unacceptable, but not all men are like that. I know you believe I'm manipulating. But why would I have encouraged Jelly to spend so much time with you at first if I was really as controlling as you portray me to be? Knowing that you were understandably having trouble trusting and interacting with men, why would I remain silent in the background? Ask your sister for confirmation if you require it. It drives me off to see anyone taken advantage of like you were. But after a while, things had to change since my wife was beginning to bear your resentment as well. Believe it or not, I cared about you, and not only because you were my sister-in-law. Well, what did I get for attempting to be a stand-up guy? Those I love and those I'm trying to help spit on me. Brian, I doubt that you have a clear picture of what actually happened that night. So that everyone can see what we're actually dealing with, I think we need to talk about it. I turned to face Shelley. Would you like to tell everyone what really happened? No, not really. But I will. Shelley, I replied softly, please be thorough and don't leave anything out. She groaned and nodded. All right, Todd, she responded shyly. To start off with, Dad's correct. We were upset at you for attempting to split Maggie and me up. I mean, sometimes, Todd, you can be so damn controlling. And those girls' nights out. I know it began off with me trying to get my sister out more, but I needed them too. I needed the time to laugh and cut loose with other women. And Maggie is my best friend. So when you demanded I cut all communication with her, it infuriated me. I felt like you were treating me like a child. I told you I wanted, no, needed, to spend time with her, but you decided I needed to stop seeing her altogether. Shelly, I said calmly, when I tried to tell you it was hurting our marriage, what did you say? I told you she was family and that I couldn't abandon my sister, Shelly replied. And I told you, I said coldly, that I was your husband. Damn it, Todd. It's that uncompromising tone that set me off. What we did wasn't right. It was mean and hurtful. I'm so sorry I went through with it. And what exactly did you do? I made it appear like I'd been with someone else. And how did you do that? Shelley looked over at her parents and then Maggie. It was obvious she didn't want to continue. I don't think we need to go into details, she softly. Well, I think we do, I replied coldly. Great, Todd, Maggie said, jumping to her little sister's defense. Keep manipulating her like you always do. Maybe you can make her dance like a puppet after you're done? Well, Maggie, I seethed, my sarcasm evident. I wouldn't talk about manipulating her if I were you. 
I thought you loved your sister. I do, she responded aghast. Then whose idea was it to shit all over her marriage? Maggie turned away. I thought as much, I continued. So, Maggie, would you like to explain to everyone in detail what my plan punishment entailed? And if I don't? Then I'll tell everyone what I believe happened. You're just trying to control this meeting, she snapped. True, but this is my meeting, isn't it? Now, do you want me to describe what I saw? No, Shelley interjected. What you saw wasn't what really happened. So, tell us what actually happened. Shelley continued uncomfortably. Maggie and I were out dancing that night, and I turned off my cell after Todd and I got into it. All of it, Shelley, I growled. Don't sugarcoat any of it. I watched her sigh deeply before starting again. Maggie and I were at the Blue Moon Club that night dancing. We weren't drunk, but we'd drunk enough not to drive, so we stayed at the club longer than normal to sober up a little. It was later than usual, so Todd called to check up on me. Since I knew he didn't want me out with Maggie, I felt like he was harassing me. I told him he wasn't my mother and didn't need to keep checking up on me. Then, I hung up on him. When he called right back, I exploded. I told him he didn't own me, and if he kept calling, I'd prove it to him, and I hung up on him again. When he called an hour later, I turned off my phone. I'm sorry to say that's when we thought of a way to make him to back off. I so ashamed we came up with the idea that I'd come home looking like I'd been with another man. After I allowed Todd to think I might... I'd tell him I hadn't, but he'd better cool it with all the demands. I was going to reaffirm to him that I was my own woman. Shelley began crying again. It was a stupid, stupid plan, and I'm so very sorry. So who was it that suggested this plan? I said coldly. We... We both came up with it, my wife stuttered before looking over at her sister. Maggie looked away. Go on, Shelley. Tell them how you planned to make me think you'd been with someone else, I said, trying to hold back the anger. We stayed at the club for another hour or so, and right before it closed, we went into the ladies' room to prepare the evidence for Todd to discover. I removed my panties from under my skirt and put them in my purse. Then Maggie pinched my breasts and butt several times to leave what would look like bite marks. Oh my God, Maggie, Peggy cried out. I can't believe you'd suggest that to your sister after what Derek did to you and Jamie. Maggie looked down silently and began to cry. Brian and Peggy appeared stunned as they stared at their daughters. Shelley pressed on. When I got home, I wasn't sure if I could go through with it. Do you remember... The first thing you said to me that night? I nodded. My response hadn't been the cool, calm one I'd wanted. I'd hoped I'd be logical and in control. What I ended up being was hurt and seething. I asked you where the hell you'd been, I said coldly. And with whom? I was madder than I think I've ever been at you. You'd come home hours later than we'd agreed on with your clothes and hair all messed up. You'd stopped answering my calls and left me with the threat you were going to show me I didn't own you. I'm sorry you surprised me, Shelley said softly. I'd never seen you that way. However, instead of stopping it right there, my anger exploded again. I felt like I was being interrogated and it pushed me over the edge. Shelley looked back at her parents, but had trouble looking them in their eyes. I told my husband it was none of his damn business who I'd been with. But if he wanted to know what had happened, to follow me upstairs, I went into our bathroom and started the shower. When I stripped, I could tell Todd saw all the small bruises on my breasts and butt. I could see he also noticed I wasn't wearing any underwear. When I asked you where they were, I interjected, you told me Fred had them. Actually, what I said, she said, stifling a sob, was that Ted had them. Sorry, I sneered but I was having a hard time breathing and hearing with my heart in my throat and the blood ringing in my ears. Oh my God, Shelley, Peggy gasped. Why? Because I was being a spoiled vindictive, Shelley bawled. I should have stopped it right there, but I didn't. When I looked into his eyes, I knew I'd gone too far. I could see his immense pain and I panicked. I retreated to the shower to clear my head and figure out what to do next. I let the water wash over me as I began crying. 
I decided I needed to tell Todd the truth immediately, and I got out of the shower. I was going to show him the evidence was really in my purse and this had just been a cruel charade. I put on my robe and went to confess to my husband, but he was already gone. He'd left his wedding ring on the kitchen table and had disappeared. You know the rest of the story. I tried to contact him, but he wouldn't return any of my calls. I even tried to stalk him at work, but they said he'd taken a leave of absence for a family emergency. I knew I was that family emergency. Then, two days ago, I was served these divorce papers. Now I'm here begging my husband to forgive me and give us another chance. I know I screwed up, but I didn't cheat on him. If you say so, I mumbled. I didn't have sex with anyone. My wife sobbed. Maybe, I said calmly. Maybe not. However, you wanted me to think you did. Congratulations, you succeeded. Now I'm not sure if you did or didn't. I will say it would be a perfect way to cover if you had cheated. Cheat on me and then claim it was only an act. You could even show me the evidence afterwards and even get your sister to back up your story. Shelley stared at me in horror. But honey, I'd never. Brian, I interrupted. Don't you and Peggy always enjoying telling about the elaborate shenanigans Maggie and Shelly used to come up with? But, Todd, those were when they were little, Brian explained. Really, are you telling me they didn't pull those kinds of things in high school and college? My father-in-law fell silent. No, Peggy interjected. We all know they were notorious for those kinds of things in high school and college. Todd, Shelly said, her voice breaking. I swear to God I didn't cheat on you. It was only an act to get you to see you were pushing too hard. I knew she hadn't cheated on me. At least not on those nights they went out. After getting the first report, there was no way in hell I wasn't going to have them watched on the, their future nights out. I was fortunate that Shelley and Maggie only went out once a week since I couldn't afford having her watched every day. This way, I knew where she'd be and when. So... Since I knew she hadn't cheated on me, why was I going through with the divorce? Pretty simple, really. She'd hurt me, hurt me very badly. She stabbed me in an area she knew would inflict the most pain. Even if she hadn't actually cheated on me, why would I want to go through life with a wife like that? How could I trust her again? With those doubts in my mind, I continued. So you can prove you didn't cheat on me? I'm not sure I can, she said quietly. Then sign the papers. No, she pleaded. You have to believe me. Why? Weren't you the one saying you'd lied to me in order to get your way? Shelley looked at me silently as her tears fell. It's simple, Shelley. I sighed deeply. I'm tired of being the only one fighting for this marriage. I have a sister-in-law who wants her baby sister back all to herself. A wife who thinks I'm her ball and chain and in-laws who encourage them. Wait a minute, Todd, Brian interjected. We never. That's right, I interrupted loudly. You two didn't do anything. I came to both of you, expressed my concerns and asked you to intervene. But did you? Son, we didn't realize it was that bad. What else was I supposed to do, Brian? Scream at the top of my lungs? Make an even bigger fool of myself. What was I supposed to do to get you to help me protect my marriage? The truth is, you needed that damn piece of paper to interfere. Brian and Peggy were silent. I wasn't surprised. There wasn't much they could say anyway. That begs the question, I said, looking at all of them. If my in-laws don't give a shit about protecting my marriage and my wife sure as hell doesn't either, why should I? Uh, that's not true. Shelley cried out. I know I might not have acted like it sometimes, but you're not the only one fighting for this marriage. Really? I said calmly. Let's see. Even though you never asked, did you ever wonder why I started demanding you stop going out with Maggie? It was because you thought she was a bad influence. Yes, but I'd told you that several months ago. So why would I have changed from not wanting you to spend so much time with her to demanding you stop seeing her completely? Because you're a jerk? Maggie mumbled. Maggie, 
Peggy chided. Hey, if the title fits, Maggie spat. I sighed and shook my head. You know, I was going to filter what I'm about to say, but I can see now there's no need. Shelly, the reason I decided to make you choose was because of what I'd learned. I'd hired a private investigator to follow you two on one of you nights out. How dare you spy on me? Maggie snapped. It's none of your business. It became my business when you led my wife into your sick nightmare, I retorted. Maggie's face showed surprise and a touch of fear. I looked over at Shelley and noticed she'd lost some of the color in her face as well. It was after that report I knew I had to do something. My guy had followed you to the Blue Moon and even talked to some of the people there. What he reported back to me scared the hell out of me. Tell me, Maggie, I sneered, did you even know the guy's name who took you out in the parking lot? All four gasped. The guy I had watching Shelley slipped out and followed you briefly. He made sure what was happening to you was consensual before returning to the club. There was no doubt it was consensual. As a matter of fact, after he did a little background research, he found out some very interesting things about you, Maggie. I paused for dramatic effect. I realized Maggie was right. I can be in jerk, especially when making my point. I'm sorry, Maggie, I said sarcastically. I didn't get to congratulate you a few months ago on being named the Blue Moon Slot of the Month. How dare you? Maggie hissed. Todd, Brian interjected hotly, I know you're hurting, but you can't. Actually, Brian, I can. Especially if the title fits. Isn't that right, Maggie? I glared at Maggie and spoke slowly, my words full of venom. If you're going to be spit-roasted, you better make sure it's by guys you can trust, not some loudmouth bartender and his friend who couldn't wait to tell everyone in the club the next night. I looked over at Brian and saw his confusion. Peggy sat silently beside him and cried. Spit-roasted, I explained. It's one guy in front and the other from behind. I watched the color drain from his face as the mental image of his daughter formed in his mind. It seems your oldest daughter is doing a hell of a job mentoring her little sister. You both should be so proud. Daddy, it wasn't like... Maggie said with tears streaming down her cheeks. By the way, Maggie, I said, continuing my assault, one of those idiots snapped off a few pics with his cell phone. They're poor quality, but the woman involved can be identified. Maggie crumpled into her chair and sobbed. So, congratulations, Brian. Your daughter is well on her way to becoming the type of woman every father fears his little girl might become. She's letting her bastard ex-husband poison the beautiful young woman she once was. It must be comforting to know your youngest daughter is trying her best to follow in her footsteps as well. I didn't do anything wrong, Todd, my wife offered up weakly. I guess that's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? I know the report said at first there was a lot of laughing and such. Exactly what you'd expect from two late twenty. Something women looking to have a fun night out. Naturally, with two attractive women, there was a lot of male attention. Of course, I found it so very endearing when both of you constantly referred to me as the warden and laughed. I watched my wife stare at me. Her shame was evident. I guess... In your mind, you didn't do anything wrong. But we both know your actions wouldn't pass most people's marital test. How many times have you danced too close to some guy and let him grab you by your forms? You? She sobbed. You should have told me. What am I? I yelled. Your chastity belt. Didn't you just tell me I was too controlling? Aren't you supposed to be an adult? Don't you know how to say no? And what would I have told you? That your sister was turning into a slut to prove to herself she was still desirable? Damn it. You're not stupid. You could see what she was doing. You knew better than I did when I told you she was dragging you into dangerous situations. But did you do anything about it? Hell no. What else could I have done? Go to your parents? Then I would have had to prove to them their little angels weren't so pure by showing them the report. Do you really think it would have made a difference? They wouldn't get involved before. What makes you think would then? As for me reminding you, my faithful wife, couldn't you realize that letting some stranger grab you while you're dancing is not okay? It's simple. 
Slap him on the arm the first time. Slap his knee between your legs the second time and walk away. Better yet? Go back to your husband and dance with him. But not you, right? Your husband needed to be taught a lesson. Even though you knew he had every right to be concerned, he needed to be shown if he didn't do as you wished. You'd simply replace him. But, Todd, I didn't sleep with anyone. Shelley shrilled. Maybe. But you wanted me to believe you did, and it worked. No, I'll never be completely sure you didn't. Todd, my wife whined. No, I interrupted. Even if you didn't sleep with that guy, you still decided to intentionally hurt me. For some reason, you determined I needed to be punished because I'm too demanding. I guess I was wrong for not wanting my wife to put herself in a position where, if something happened out of her control, it could destroy our marriage. Apparently, I needed to pay for my fears. No, Shelley whimpered. That wasn't what happened. Bullshit, I think that's exactly what happened, I said, more harshly than I intended. You allowed someone who you knew was hurt and bitter towards men to convince you our love and marriage wasn't enough, that I was somehow manipulating you, like I was your warden, your albatross. At some point, you chose to believe my love was smothering you, holding you down and keeping you from something better. Somehow, in your mind, I became your enemy. Your friggin' enemy, shouted I, wiping away a stray tear. I've spent the last three years trying to act like your lover, your friend, and your husband. And now it turns out I'm some kind of tyrant, some kind of ball and chain? You hurt me, Shelley. You tore out my heart because you wanted to prove a point. You destroyed my trust in you, in us. I'm not sure how that can ever be restored. Now you're telling me you didn't cheat on me and you have the gall to ask me to believe and trust you? Well, I don't, I sneered. Whether you had sex with someone that night or not, you certainly screwed me over and destroyed our marriage. So regardless of how you feel now, you wanted your freedom? You got it. But that's not what I want, my wife cried. Really? So what is it you do want? I want you to forgive me. I want you to give me the chance to try and earn your trust back. I know what I did was cruel. I don't know how I let myself get to the point where I would ever think it was okay to do to someone I love, but I did. She stared at me with those emerald eyes, beseeching me for another chance. So, what are you really willing to give up? She looked at me bewildered. Shelley, I put in for an out-of-state transfer at work. It should take a month or two, but I'll be moving to California. They all gasp. Oh my God, Peggy gasped. Son, Brian tried to say calmly, but his voice gave away his concern. Isn't that drastic? I don't think so, Brian, I said condescendingly. I'm getting away from this toxic family. So, I continued, turning my sight back to my wife. So what are you willing to give up? Are you willing to leave the state? Are you willing to break all contact with your sister until she goes and gets professional help? Are you willing to leave your family? Todd, please, Shelley whimpered. They're my family. It's all right, Shelley, I snorted. I'll never ask you to choose your husband over your family again. I did that with your sister and look what it got me. I sure did learn my lesson. As for choosing your spouse over your family, that's something you should come to grips with before we got married. I thought you had, but I was wrong. Remember what we used to say? Us against the world? But I guess it was only some foolish romantic notion, huh? No, I'd never ask you to pick me above your family because that would make me the bad guy. I'd end up being the villain again. No, I sighed. It's probably better this ends now. Like an early release. Todd. I don't want an early release. I don't think you understand, Shelley, I said coldly. This divorce isn't for you. It's for me. I'm the one looking at the prison of loving someone who would take the most valuable and precious gift she'd ever given me, her love and her body, and forever ruined it simply to show me she's in charge. It's me who gets to look forward to a lifetime of wondering when she'll feel safe enough to try this again. And if it hadn't already, would she actually go through with it for real this time? 
Will it be when we have kids and I can't easily leave? Or will she decide to hide it so it can be her little secret? Her private knowledge she paid me back and that she's her own woman? Regardless if you never did it or never do it again, it'll take months, if not years, before I could learn to trust you even a little bit. Of course, by that time, you'll be resenting me for not completely trusting you. Added to that, I'll still be considered that monster who stole you away from your family. I'll end up being the bad guy again. You've shown me you'll do it once. I have no reason to believe it won't happen again. No. She pleaded through her tears. I promise you it won't. You promise? You mean like you promised at our wedding? We vowed to love, honor, and respect each other when we married. Hell, it didn't even last three years for you. Please, Todd, Shelley begged. Please. I looked at her and my heart broke. The tears began to pour down my cheeks. I knew I still loved her and would for a very long time, but it wasn't enough. I loved you, Shelley. I'm sorry that my flaws drove you away. I realize I'm hard to live with at times, but I thought you knew I loved you with everything I had. It simply wasn't enough. It was, she replied. It is. Todd, please don't do this. I know you still love me. You're right, I said, nodding. I still do, but not like I did before. Before, you were everything to me, but not anymore. How I feel about you is very different. It's probably closer to what your love was for me. No, don't say that. I do love you. Maybe, I sighed, but it's certainly different than the way I loved you. I would never even have thought of ever hurting you like that. The thought of causing you that kind of pain would made me ill and torn out my heart, but it didn't stop you, did it? If that's your meaning of love, you can keep it. Shelley buried her face in her hands and wept. I looked over at Maggie. You win? I sneered. It looks like you got your wish. Your sister's marriage is as dead as yours. She's all yours now. You said earlier you loved her? Well, take a good look at what your love did to her. Be sure to tell her how much better off she is without this warden. Maybe she can end up like you who couldn't find her own happiness, so... She had to destroy her sisters. I hope you get help before you destroy your daughter's life as well. Maggie glared at me through her tears. I turned back to Shelley's parents. So that's the life sentence I'm facing, I said calmly. That paper over there is my early release. I want a wife who'll attempt to work through problems with me instead of trying to punish me because she didn't get her way. I need someone who, if they're angry with me, will still talk to me like an adult because they have some respect for me. That respect will come easily because she'll know how much I love and respect her. She'll know I'm trying my best to give us a good marriage and make her happy. In short, I deserve a wife who'll fight for our marriage, not some spoiled little girl. You might not think I deserve that. I stopped and looked at everyone there. But I sure as hell do. I think I deserve a good life with a truly loving wife. So please sign the papers and free me so I can find her. Emotionally spent, I got up and left four stunned individuals in my wake. Was it overly dramatic? Probably, but I felt much better. I felt like I said what I needed to and could begin moving on. Surprisingly, three weeks later, I was on the West Coast. My transfer had come through faster than anticipated. I'd had to scramble, but I'd found a college friend named Ty who lived in the Long Beach area close to where I'd be working. I'd arranged to live there for a month until I could find a place of my own. I'd talked with Shelley on the phone a couple times before I left. I confessed that I knew she hadn't slept with someone those nights. I told her my pie confirmed it the next day. I think she thought that would mean we'd forget about the divorce. But it didn't really change anything. I still didn't trust her now, and to be very honest, I was done. I knew I still loved her, but I was tired of fighting for the marriage. When I told her I was headed out to law the next week, she became hysterical. I'm not sure why. I thought things were clear that night we met at her parents' house. It seemed as if she still believed we could work through this. She actually asked me to hold off looking for her replacement until we could meet face to face. 
I told her I would since the idea of replacing her made me ill, but I didn't see much reason in us meeting. I mean, what was left to talk about? She was sorry, but I already knew that. I was, too. She said it wouldn't happen again, I didn't believe her, so that pretty much ended the conversation. Still, now I was hustling to get back to my friend's apartment. I was trying to get it cleaned up a little before Shelly arrived later that night. She'd called me a couple days before and said she was coming out to La. She said we'd talk, and then she'd hand me the signed divorce papers. Long Beach is beautiful. The weather is fantastic, and the girls are beautiful. Unfortunately, with such a scenic setting comes people. Lots of people. And traffic. And smog. And a ridiculously high cost of living and, well, more people. I was walking up the stairs to my temporary home. A second-story apartment with a view. Okay, the view was more a sliver of the pier seen between several buildings and a couple of palm trees. I smiled to myself knowing if I was going to live here, I was going to have to find a roommate. And quickly. About halfway up the stairs, I heard the scream. It sounded like a wounded animal at first, then became loud sobbing. I recognized it as Shelley's. Immediately. I rushed up the remaining steps and found her leaning on the concrete walkway. She had her face buried in her hands and was crying. Shelly? I said loudly, causing her to look up at me with the most pitiful stare. You told me you'd wait. She sobbed. What? What? I replied, obviously confused. She turned and looked at the apartment door. Standing there, inside the door, was a tall, beautiful blonde in a white satin robe that had it embroidered on it. I wasn't exactly sure why she'd even bothered putting the robe on, since she'd failed to tie it. She was on full display. Her long, bleached blonde hair and big blue eyes certainly grabbed attention. However, not as much as her huge pouty lips and teeth so white they were hard to look at. Her huge breasts were obviously fake, but it was still hard not to admire them, as well as the rest of her long, lean body. But it was her shaved pussy, flushed and shiny from recent use, that made me shake my head. Damn it, Tiff. You've got to stop answering the door like that. I chuckled. One of these days, you're going to kill someone. She looked at me as if I was speaking some ancient lost language. All the beauty and ike of an inflatable doll. What? What? She said in her sweet little childlike voice. What if it had been some old guy at the door? The sight of you like that would have given him a heart attack. Tiff giggled and closed her robe. Sorry, she smiled. No, it wasn't an act. There really were seagulls down by the pier that had more common sense than my roommate's girlfriend. She worked the front at some restaurant, so yeah, she was an actress. Surprise. She actually was a sweet girl, well, sort of. I'd spent the last week half expecting her to misquote a particular movie line. I'm not a bad girl. I've just paid a lot of money to look like one. I turned back to Shelley and offered her my hand. She tentatively took it and wiped away a tear. Shelley, this is Tiffany Ray, Ty's girlfriend. Tiff, this is Shelley, my um, his wife. Shelley said, clearly regaining some of her composure, at least for the time being. Tiff, where's Ty? I asked, avoiding any real discussion until we could get inside and not provide cheap entertainment for the neighborhood. Oh, he's still asleep, she giggled. I think I wore him out. Tiff led Shelley and me back into the apartment. Once inside, Shelley sat on the sofa while Tiff said goodbye, went back into Ty's room and shut the door. I looked at Shelley and realized she looked lost. You're early. I didn't expect you until this evening. Well, she said softly, I had this great idea. She smiled sadly. It kind of blew up in my face. It seems all my plans have been doing that lately. She looked at me and continued. First, I need to apologize. Shelley, we've already been through all this. No, this is new, she said, gathering herself. I came down here so I could tell you what happened after our meeting and to tell you how things have changed. 
I was hoping it would make you reconsider divorcing me. But after what just happened, I'm not sure it'll be enough. When I saw that woman, for a moment I thought you'd already replaced me. I told you I wouldn't, Shelley. I know, she said softly as she wiped her eyes. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but then I thought maybe this was a way of paying me back for what I did to you. I know you wouldn't, even though I would have certainly deserved it. I'm so sorry. I thought that... She wiped away a tear and gathered herself. Todd, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I acted like a spoiled little girl. I knew I'd hurt you, but I'm not sure I realized how badly until just a few minutes ago. Now I understand why the fact I didn't actually cheat on you doesn't mean anything. I'd hurt you in an area you never thought I would or could. I'm so sorry it took seeing that naked woman in your apartment to finally make me realize just how deeply I'd betrayed you. She paused to wipe away a fresh set of tears. She glanced up at me and I could see her pain, since it reflected my own. I know this won't change things, she added, but I'd like to tell you what happened after our meeting. May I? All right, Shelley. I had my say that night, so I'll try not to interrupt you. Say what you need to. The fact was, I was praying there was something she could do or say which could change things. When I'd just found her crying outside my door, I'd felt my heart clench, as it hadn't in over a month. I knew I still loved her, and seeing her in anguish, all I wanted to do was grab her and protect her. It wasn't lost on me. I was urgently looking for a path back to her, to us. I missed her every second for the past four weeks, and the nights without her were torture. I just couldn't see a way for it to happen. First, some of the things you said the previous time we met were harsh, but true. It touched off several debates, battles really, over the next two weeks. The first one was between Maggie and me. After you left, Maggie apologized for her part in what happened, but then started berating you for your behavior. I went off on her. I informed her we both knew who came up with the notion that dreadful night. I told everyone it was still my fault, though. I couldn't believe I'd been so petty as to do that to you. Too little, too late, right? She said, looking at me with a small, sad smirk. I know I should've done it months earlier, but I didn't. And now I'm paying for it. However, I finally did speak up for you. For us. When Maggie tried to shift some of the blame on you again, I went ballistic. We ended up screaming and yelling at each other. I finally said, even though I'm to blame for agreeing to go through with it, it was at her suggestion. I asked her how she could ever do that to me. We both ended up in tears. Mom and Dad had conversations with Maggie later that week as well. Mom informed her they were done watching Jamie just so she could go act like a slut. When he told her how ashamed he was of her, Dad broke down in tears. I'm not sure which of the comments upset her the most, but she agreed to go get some therapy after crying for a few days. She began visiting a counselor last week. We're hoping that she can resolve all of her problems for Jamie's sake as well as her own, but it will be a lengthy process. My parents have also been experiencing difficulties. I believe this is primarily due to me. I almost broke down when you told me that your transfer had gone through earlier than anticipated and that you would be heading to Los Angeles. I watched as all of my aspirations to live out the rest of my days with you fell apart all around me. Mom got up and smacked me for being a whiner and hysterically crying in front of them. She had only ever done that once, back in high school. This time she threw me a nasty look and urged me to grow up. She told Daddy that if I was old enough to get married, I should be old enough to start acting like an adult when he tried to interfere. She told me to pull myself together and try my best to make things right if I was really that sorry. She reminded Dad that they'd argued a lot with my grandmother when they were first married, so I suppose Dad's mother had a terrible habit of getting involved in their marriage early on. That's probably why Mom and Dad sought to avoid getting involved in Maggie's and my marriages. Since our conversation, tensions have been high between my parents. I'm aware of the numerous issues, past traumas, and resentment they need to resolve. My circumstances and Maggie's probably don't help. She inhaled and let out a long, heavy sigh. That only leaves me 
and I'm not sure how to start. I was a little confused when I glanced at her. She gave a sorrowful smile. I'm comfortable speaking to your heart because we both know that I operate on emotions, but it's when I try to present a reasoned argument for why you should try to save our marriage that I need your assistance. Todd, I came here to ask you to give our marriage another chance. To do that, I need to appeal to both your heart and your mind. I know I'll definitely perform this poorly. It is not mine, but your strength. But I ask you to refrain from making this a dispute. Not that we don't discuss the gaps in my reasoning. I'm suggesting that we talk about them instead of arguing about them. We are not in a contest where one of us prevails and the other fails. I will definitely win if you chose to try again, but you will also. Lastly, she added gently, we both know I'm going to cry during this. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I realize it bothers you, but you'll just have to get over it. This is too damn important. I suppressed a smile, knowing that tears would follow. She would undoubtedly cry, and it would be simple to keep her that way. That was what I had done at her parents' place the night we met. I was happy that she had adopted this strategy and a little taken aback. I had assumed that this was the cause of her visit. I also had a deep-seated desire to keep our marriage intact, even though rationally I realized it couldn't be done. I didn't think I had it in me to try again because the trust had been damaged. The best course of action was to split up and attempt to restart everything separately. All right, I said softly. You allowed me to say what I needed before I left. I'll return the courtesy. Thank you. First, I need to give you these. After a time, she reached into her purse and took out a manila envelope. She handed it to me, staring at me carefully. Although I will always be ashamed of the things I did, those are the signed divorce papers as promised. I hope you don't file them, but if you do, I will understand. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't try to fight for our marriage even though it's too late. You mentioned that, Todd, you should have a wife who will stand up for your marriage. I'm battling, though. I understand you think that trying to mend this marriage would take a lot of time and effort. I agree but I firmly think it will be worthwhile. First, first, do you love me? Yes, but that's not enough. Please, Todd. I'm trying to establish a base on which I plan to show you logically why we should try again. I know these are loaded questions, but they're necessary. Now, do you believe I love you? Shelley, after what you did, can you blame me for doubting your love? Honey, I don't blame you. I know I would be thinking the same thing if I were you, but even if it isn't as strong as you'd once believed it was, and even with the stupid, hurtful things I did, do you believe I still love you? I nodded gradually. The actual problem wasn't that I didn't know she still loved me. Trust was the issue. I had turned into the adversary despite her betrayal, albeit not to the extent I had feared. Even for a brief while, she had favored someone else over me. Normally, that wouldn't be a huge deal, but... She had allied with someone else before attacking me, she whispered. Thank you, stifling her tears. That was the most important piece. If you didn't still love me, or if you didn't think I loved you, then nothing else would matter. She reclined and braced herself. I sensed a difficult question was on the way. Todd, she whispered softly, I know that when we last had a conversation, you said that I had betrayed your trust. I totally get that. But you also said that you would never be able to completely believe that I wouldn't cheat on you. That's unfair. You even mentioned that your private investigator confirmed that I never cheated on you. Yeah, sometimes I let guys grab myself by my uniform when we danced. But it never came to that, and I regret going that far. There was never another guy and make you jealous. You know that Ted I mentioned that night was the one who took Maggie out to the parking lot since you informed me that I was being watched that time. He wasn't mine. He was one of her boyfriends. That said, even though I seriously damaged your belief in me, even though since we've been together, I've never even kissed another man, let alone had sex with one. Do you believe I'll probably cheat on you if we stay married? Shelly, I never thought it was possible before that night, 
I stated reassuringly. But now... Now that possibility haunts me. Damn it, Todd. I'm not talking about possibilities. I'm talking about probabilities. It's a possibility that within 10 years you'll die in a car accident. Or I'll develop breast cancer. The possibilities of something bad happening are endless. I'm asking you if you think that if we stay together, that I'll ever cheat on you? I considered my response. I was attempting to approach it objectively rather than making a harsh remark in response to illustrate my point. To be honest, I knew there was a lower chance of her cheating on me than there was of her remaining faithful. It would be a simple wager for a gambler, but I wasn't really a gambler. I suppose the obvious question was, can someone be accurately classified as someone who has never really done anything before? When a man appears to have stolen something only once, but has never actually stolen anything before, can he still be deemed a thief? The response was, no, please, and be just. No, I mutely admitted, I don't think you'll ever cheat on me. Peering deeply into my eyes, she added now. Do you think I'll ever hurt you again? I looked at her, perplexed. This logical leap was quite large. Seeing my reaction, she gave me a kind smile. The answer is yes, honey, she crooned softly. I promise that if we stay married long enough, I'll hurt you again. I'll let you down in some way or disappoint you in some way. I'll act emotionally without considering my actions rationally. In other words... I'll hurt you again. I promise you will harm me too if that makes you feel any better. You'll disregard my feelings or ignore me in some other way without giving them adequate thought. The truth is that occasionally you will let me down and disappoint me as well. Sorry, but marriage is like that. What'll make this marriage worth it will be how we deal with those wounds and disappointments. Will we be able to look into each other's eyes and realize we're married to a flawed human being? Will we be able to remember that we love each other and would never intentionally do any lasting harm to each other? I'd been observing her closely by now. Though I wasn't sure I agreed with everything she said, I still found it entertaining to watch her. By now, she was practically yelling, and she was using her arms to make enormous gestures while using her hands to speak. Her heart was exposed for everyone to see, along with her sincerity and enthusiasm. This was the woman who, when she left, left a huge void in my life since she was such a delight and source of life. Just like clockwork, she went on. You've told me innumerable times that I add color to your world, but you should know that I add structure and focus to mine. Without you, my existence is formless and abstract, but with you, we can paint an incredible picture of a marriage that will last a lifetime. Never doubt that you are necessary to me. It's highly likely that I won't intentionally damage you. Please, if you believe that my intentions are solely self-serving, file those documents so that we can both benefit. However, if you choose to look, you will see a lady who is attempting to become the kind of wife you deserve and are dreaming of. Though I'm still a long way off, I'm improving and learning. I know you're closer to my dream than I am to yours, but you're not there yet, darling. You're not the husband I deserve or the one I dream of. Todd, please understand that I will eventually ask you to tear up those divorce papers. Though it won't happen anytime soon, I will eventually. With a pistol aimed at me and waiting for an opportunity to fire, we cannot have the marriage we both desire. It can't continue forever but I realize that you need it as security until you reach a moment where you start to trust me again. Honey, you mentioned that you needed a wife who would fight for your marriage. Well, I need a husband who will not give up on our union. I know you were fighting for it on your own and I apologize. I can't go back in time, but I can try to change the future. In addition to our meeting this weekend, I must inform you that I'm currently searching for an apartment. I left my job and took a new one in Los Angeles. I fear I'll have to locate a roommate after seeing the rental costs. Now don't look so shocked. It's not hard to find an entry-level job in my profession. Almost all employers are searching for a young, inexperienced, slightly intelligent person who can work hard at entry-level wages. The reason is also very straightforward. 
I need to be near you. I'm committed to our marriage until the divorce is official, no matter how our meeting goes today. You have to be able to see my honesty every day if you wish to look, for you to understand it. That is not possible given how far away I live. Preface. No, you aren't the bad guy who took me away from my family. I apologize if you ever felt that way. I want you to know that I always choose you. Maybe not every time, but overall. Maybe this leap of faith will make it easier for you to believe that. If not, I'll understand, but I won't say I'll be happy about it. No, I have to leave before I look like a complete fool and start crying in public. Please give me a call if you would like to discuss further. I appreciate you coming to see me today. She dried her eyes once more before getting up, and I escorted her silently to the door where she opened it, turned around, and gave me a little peck on the cheek. She said, I love you, Todd, and I always will. Shelley, I love you too, I replied softly. I felt such a profound emptiness when she left. It was like entering an office with fluorescent lighting after coming from a bright sunny day outside. I sighed, took a seat, and spent the next few hours reviewing what Shelley had said to me. I laughed to myself as I realized I was sitting in an apartment that wasn't mine, in a new city, alone. It was definitely a new beginning. Ty and Tiff had left to go out to dinner and left me to my dilemma. I was at a crossroads and my next choice would affect my very near future. I had come out to law to start fresh, and now Shelley was basically offering me the same only with us doing it as a couple. Greetings, Shelley answered in a feeble voice, clearly having been sobbing. How are you doing, Shelley? As soon as I realized how ridiculous my inquiry was, I said, she mutely said, no, I'm not. You are missed. I apologize. You didn't call for that reason, I'm sure. <sighs> what is it? Well, in a way, that is what I'm calling about. I replied gently. I was wondering if you would mind me joining you in looking for an apartment tomorrow. Obviously, she muttered. Moreover, I wanted to know if you were still seeking a roommate, I said. She paused, and there was an overwhelming hush. To my astonishment, she responded, No, not really. I'm married. I'm not seeking for a guy roommate with benefits. My hubby is precisely what I'm searching for. I grinned as I added, Well, I can't give any guarantees, but if we do it carefully, that seems like a very strong possibility to me. Once more, there was nothing but stillness on the other end. I thought I heard someone sobbing, but I wasn't sure. Shelley? Meekly, I said. Meet me at my hotel at nine tomorrow morning, she said, shedding a tearful and laughing simultaneously.